Welcome back, everybody, to the Art and Place of Conflict conference. My name is Jared Dean. I work for Hollywell Trust. We're one of the project partners in the Theatre and Peace Building Academy. Delighted to be one of the project partners, along with uh, the Playhouse, obviously, uh, and Thomas Darcy McGee Foundation and Queen's University. Thanks for sticking with us today and coming back into this session, which is going to be with John Paul Lederach. Delighted so far with the conference. It's been, I think, a reflection of the deep conversations that have taken place already in the conference and the, the nearly three years that we've been running. And there's more to come. There's more to come now this afternoon. And it's going to start with um, a conversation with John Paul Lederach. And I'm going to read this to make sure I get it right. So John Paul Lederach is Senior Fellow at Humanity United and Professor Emeritus of International Peacebuilding at the Joan B. Crock Institute for Peace Studies at University of Notre Dame. He's a renowned peace builder and he's been active in Latin America, Africa, Southeast and Central Asia. He's published 24 books and manuals on peace building and negotiation. And today, John Paul is going to give us an address on artistic processes and settings of conflict. So, jo I'm going to hand over to John Paul now in a wee minute, but I'll be back just afterwards. They have a conversation with him, a, a bit of a Q&A. So, Bear with us, and I'll see you on the other side. John Paul, it's over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone, at least uh, morning here where I'm at. I'm very happy to be uh, gathered with you today. And uh, I know there are many friends and colleagues in this wider listening audience. So if I could, I'd give you all a big hug. Um, this conference carries the title, Art in the Place of Conflict. Uh, my sharing today will focus on the place of art in building, plea, in building peace. Uh, the small switch that I'm trying to make is not to minimize um, the important conference nuances that come with the title. Art in lieu of conflict, art in situ, art as entry, art that questions, all these are captured in that original title. My orientation will take a bit more of a personal bent. I will explore in the next few minutes the long pathway um, that I have traveled in locating the significance, the bridging, and the place of the artistic process and art itself, and how it plays out when the human community opens toward healing and understanding rather than harm and humiliation. I say personal because the path I was on, one that now understands art as centered at the cutting edge of transformation and not a marginal or peripheral add-on to the vocation of rehumanization, that path did not originally imagine a dwelling place, art at the hearth, in order for art to remain at the edge while sitting dead center in the transformational process. Let me start with a story of how this pathway began. I have chosen to capture this by sharing portions of the conclusion to a recent volume of poetry yet unpublished that I have been developing. I titled that conclusion, Afterwards, Musings on Poetry and Peace Building though I have edited some for the purpose of this address this morning with you. I begin with recounting a powerful memory of a single conversation in Central America almost 30 years ago. Three of us sat in the veranda shade of a restaurant in Managua, Nicaragua. Sometime in 1993, on the other side of double decade wars, we met to discuss the plight of former combatants. Of my two colleagues, she had traversed the inside of the Sandinista revolution. He, the years of youth soldiering with the Contra resistance, two former enemies seated together and now working on healing the wounds. Those who signed the peace accords 
led the rebellions and commanded the troops had fared relatively well in the bumpy pathway from war to peace. Those who carried guns up and down riverways and montañas, troopers of lower ranks, found that penned promises held few rewards. Hopelessness has a way to proliferate a family of war-branded children. Betrayal, bitterness, cynicism, indignation, resentment, righteous rage. Our working lunch traversed this long list of grievances and challenges that faced their incipient movement to accompany fighters barely surviving the peace. In the battle between dignity and humiliation, despair was winning. How do you keep hope alive, I remember asking. Without pause, the former child soldier, who perhaps had reached 25 years of age, dropped his fork, lifted his head, closed his eyes, and recited an Eduardo Galeano poem that I had never heard. We have the joy of our joys and also the joy of our pains because we find little interest in the painless life that consumerism packages and sells. And we take pride in the price of so much pain that with such love we pay. We have the joy of our mistakes, the stumbling downfalls that prove our passion for walking and our love for the journey's path. We have the joy of our losses, because the struggle for justice and beauty, the struggle for justice and beauty are worth the pain even when we lose. And more than anything, above all else, we have the joy of our hopes. In the face of disillusionment, when hopelessness has twisted itself into a faddish item for universal consumption, we continue to believe in the startling powers of the human embrace. Word for word, phrasing to perfection, he reinforced the widely held view that all Nicaraguans are poets. I remember this moment not only because it introduced me to a brilliant poem, or because I felt myself transformed by simply basking in the presence of this young poet rising. I remember because this marked the moment I let poetry back into my life. Years later, I returned to journals and forgotten files. I wanted to look more carefully at something I have noted about my own journey. How did I let graduate studies and becoming a young professional take the poetry out of me? I found an old file of my poetry that traversed my late teens into my early 20s. Pecked out on a manual typewriter, a few had been published in a now defunct poetry review. The ending dates of those poems reached to about 1978 around the time that I returned to university studies and entered more seriously into research and academic writing. I published several books prior to and after finishing my doctorate. I professionally grew into the practices of mediation and peace building. Across a 15 year period, I found no intentional writing of poetry with one exception. I uncovered a few spontaneous poetic lines at the margin of the notes in my journals, scribbled, never pulled in place, anarchists headed for the streets, a small colony of impulses begging to be noticed. In this period, poetry skittered on the far edges of my academic writing 
mold-like. Mold, according to the dictionary. Tubular branching hyphae that live on organic decomposing matter. The best conditions, a bit of warmth and a bit of moisture. Hyphae remain mostly invisible until they feather and form as a colony. Maybe only the far edge of professional piecework holds the habitus for poiesis. Maybe only on the margin do we find the hearth for art. There on untouched skins, just beyond the heat of doing deliverings, sensorous light, creating being has a chance to feather and grow. What I had not noticed, peace building also feathers on decomposing edges. Something ineffable bubbled around that Managuan table. It shifted me. I felt it. I cannot exactly explain it. I started writing poetry again. They say that hope is not a strategy, but I have never seen people shift away from deep harm without hope. The tough ones will always deny it. The realists will blind it, but something ineffable always bubbles in the paradox of the humus being. One lunch with a young poet holding fast to the human embrace in spite of impossible odds, seeded a catalyst to let a part of me back in again. That part, I had let my profession quarantine. It took another 15 years before I realized the arts, in my case, poetry sit at the heart, not the margins of social change. Ineffable, unspeakable, inexpressible. These invisible dimensions capture the inside, the inner experience of deteriorating conflict and the degradation of violence. Conflict, the great disruptor, will always stop us short. It makes us look again and again. Meaning can no longer be taken for granted. When meaning is suspended, we feel upended, lost, what the Spanish language calls desubicado and desplazado, uncertain about and uprooted from place, as in, I'm not sure what place I have in this world. Then a roiling journey begins. We wander, we seek, we try to locate a compass. Maps we had relied on no longer work. Mostly because there is no arrow that says you are here. We argue, we demand, we question events, actions, them, us, me, inside me, inside you. What really is going on? Where is this going and why? We are, after all, sense-seeking beings. Our actions are based on the meaning we attach to things. We want our lives and actions, our experience and our existence to mean something. Meaning always emerges from an act of comparison. We locate what something means by how it situates and associates with other things. We know how to get somewhere if we know our coordinates. Even if we do nothing, which many of us do with considerable energy in the midst of pain and conflict, we feel a deep need to explain. 
we cannot take ambiguity for long. We feel something inside of us long before we have words that make sense of what we feel. Inevitably, we search for words and try to string them into storylines, even when none of them seem adequate. They are at least an appearance. They appear as a witness to reality. But reality does not begin when words emerge. In traversing the geography of violence, words more often than not shoot out from the gut like experimental probes launched into space, trying to bounce off of something out there so that they can echo back towards something in here. When a probe seems to resonate with the mysterious unspeakable, when the inner ineffable aligns with the external communal, poetry and art happen. The word becomes flesh and creates colonies that feather into narratives. We tend to live into the stories we tell. At times, our stories take on mythological proportions. Over time, some of our stories freeze. I discovered somewhere along the way that peace building rushes in where fools fear to tread. Chasing unspeakable probes, trying to land on unreachable shores. In 1997, I was invited back to Corrymeela in Northern Ireland, not far from where many of you sit today. Named as a lumpy crossing place near the Antrim coast, this habitus provided space for people to rehumanize as the troubles emerged and grew across sectarian decades. My invitation came with a request. The ceasefires from some years earlier had engendered hope that the farther shore, this phrase of the greatest of your contemporary poets, that this farther shore had come within sight, only to be swallowed by a thickening fog. We knew how to navigate the troubles and violence, they said. We are not so clear how we recuperate when our anticipation that the troubles may be over suffers irreparable damage. What do you do when hope has been slayed? I could find no English translation of Galeanos Nosotros that I had heard around that Managuan table. I offered one to Corey Mila at the start of, I, of our sessions. It's the one I just read you. I still carry it with me. I read it often, especially when words lay quietly at the side of my bed after irreparable days, their silence deafening my sleepless nights. The Bridge. Here is a painting titled Stone Bridge in Fall by artist Jason Tetko. The bridge is found near his home in northeastern Pennsylvania. He has painted this bridge on numerous occasions in different seasons with varying shades of sun and light. This particular painting now hangs on a wall where I work from at home. Mediators have preferred metaphors we live by, though perhaps one of the most common remains the bridge. In our meaning-making pursuits, metaphors highlight some associations and defocus others. The bridge as metaphor gets deployed as a way to help angry people understand 
a mediator's ambiguous presence in the middle of their raging fight. Mediators use the bridge metaphor to highlight three images, more often than not. A bridge crosses a divide. A bridge makes it possible for people to meet. A bridge narrows the distant shores. Rarely mentioned by mediators are the unnoticed elements of the bridge, the mysterious side of casting about between both invisible and unreachable shores. These hidden elements may well offer good advice for any mediator fellowship. You don't build a bridge starting in the middle, a Filipino colleague once told me. Starting points for bridges exist because separate shores exist. Notice your starting point. Take note of the shores that are perceived around your starting point. A strong bridge needs deep foundations on both shores. The keystone, the last stone set in the arch, the keystone is useless without strong foundations. Never mistake a keystone for a foundation. A bridge is made to walk over. If you want to be a bridge, prepare to be walked on. If you do not like to be walked on, do not offer to be a bridge. A bridge can never see its own underbelly and never shows it to those who walk across the ark. The underbelly can only be seen with a bit of distance and by noticing the reflective mirror from the water that flows under the bridge. The water's ephemeral sheen and shimmer offers a view of the hidden wholeness, Parker Palmer's wonderful phrase, for how we choose to live into integrity. If you want to be a bridge, notice beauty and shadow. If peace building is the bridge, art is the ephemeral reflection of the hidden wholeness. The compass. After 40 years of living and working in geographies of conflict and pain, I have not come across any magic formulas. I would distill as follows the challenge for cultivating feathering peace in places where our human family has lost our humanity. Here are 12 musings. One, analysis of human conflict breaks things apart. Some call this understanding. Analysis does not have the heart to put things back together. Two, conflict and peace skills offer tools for carving paths, but tools do not show which pathway to open in a dense forest. They do not sustain the metal to face an impossible climb. Tools do not nurture the patience needed to carve through blustering waters. Three, how humans make meaning remains a poetic unfolding mystery. If you choose to enter this mystery in the midst of conflict, prepare for an epic journey. Four, listening is the compass for the Odyssey. A compass is round. A listening compass 
has a delicate, relentlessly spinning needle. This needle does not seem interested in finding north. It's drawn toward other sources. Five, listening is whole body, whole environment, and divine time sensitive. The needle keeps pointing closer to home than we expect. If you cannot feel and hear yourself, you will not feel and hear others. Six, we humans listen into deep truth at roughly the same, at roughly the same level, we listen to our enemies. That is why our needles spin. Seven, northless is not all bad. Not knowing in the midst of deep conflict holds greater potential for unleashing understanding than learned knowledge. Eight, it takes courage to unlearn. Nine, curiosity is a five syllable word. It holds the doorway that opens and closes every haiku. 10. Remember that curiosity is a verb and haiku the spinning needle that every now and then stops dead just for a moment. Make note of where the needle points. 11. Don't miss the haiku moments on your odyssey. Haikus are everywhere. They are mostly invisible. In deep conflict, you will need what St. Benedict called the ear of the heart. If you are to hear, the compass needle stops. And 12, as soon as you make peace, start over. As soon as you make peace, start over. As a conclusion, I have found these things to be true about art and peace building. Art brings joy and replenishes the soul after the salt and wind experienced at the raw edge of human storms have battered our fragile outer shells. Art tilts the eyes and ears toward the heart, listening differently for the vastness of voice in and around us. Art softens our calloused membrane that sits between our inner and our outer worlds. Art nurtures the courage to hold fast to the compass when the northless needles spin wild. Art feathers and grows at the edges even as everything decomposes. Art instills a seed-like, light-seeking tenacity, insisting on breaking through even the hardest crust. Art offers a trusted, shimmering companion, unafraid to send dispatches from the underbelly of our bridges. Art refuses to forget. Art remembers gracefully. Art dwells at the hearth, enfolding the mystery of our shared humanity. Thank you and may you go well.
John Paul, thank you very much. Thanks a million for that insightful and inspirational address. And as we agreed beforehand, I have a couple of questions for you. Now, I want to start by asking about peace without art and if we can have peace without art and the role of the artist as a peace builder. How important is art to building peace? And can we have peace without it? Well, I think the answer is no, because the um, p peace requires a constant act of creativity. It's not a once and overdone thing. And the act of creativity sits at the very heart of the artistic process. And this has been somewhat of the disconnect that we've approached peace more from the standpoint that it's somehow a technical rational process, when in fact it touches us holistically. So we need um, ways of being with the holism that's represented there. And I think there, that it is inevitable um, that uh, peace can only be f fully, f fully developed through this capacity, um, somewhat innate capacity that we have as a human community to create. Um, so peace building, uh, I, I, I am very reluctant to reduce art to a tool. Mm. which sometimes can happen and quite often, especially in, the, in the, 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 the modalities by which we, you know, create projects and deliverables and the whole works that go with that. I much prefer to hold um, art as something that is uh, inherent to the rehumanization that is needed when dehumanization has been the mode by which we have related. And that transformational process means that... Um, Art is a little like breathing. Without it, we aren't human. Okay, so, John Paul, art in the past has been used as a, a tool for conflict and used in propaganda as a way of dehumanizing, as, as you've just mentioned there. So how do we square that circle when, it's like today we're talking about the importance of art when dealing with conflict, uh, when art always, isn't always a good thing? No, it couldn't be. Empirically speaking, you're absolutely accurate. Art is a powerful force and it can be mobilized for, for ways in which it contributes to dehumanization. Um, it's, it, you know, for, and this you can explore in, in a thousand ways. In the, in the streets of um, Belfast, the murals, you knew you were moving from one narrative to the next, from one block to the next by, without a single word, just the visuals of what were emergent, what symbols were mobilized. Um, in a Somali context, totally radically different. Um, song and poetry are the ways that people engage in conflict. And a, a, a poet is revered um, for their capacity uh, to pull from the long oral history that they have in ways that justify the call to arms against another clan. And they can equally be the call to end the violence. So it isn't that art in and of itself uh, exclusively moves in one direction. It's a very powerful force. Precisely what I said earlier, it touches us so holistically that it touches on the full range of the human capacity. And our biggest challenge is literally, how do we mobilize those things that mitigate the ways in which we dehumanize and mobilize those which rehumanize our capacity to be a more flourishing community together? And that's, um, so I think it sits at the center of a lot of this in many ways, even if we don't fully notice it. Okay, and I want to touch on a more contemporary piece now, John Paul, if I can. Um, and thinking about the United States at the minute, and uh, particularly around the Black Lives Matter movement, where we're seeing art being used to rehumanize, is it, ha is it having much of an impact on America? You're speaking specifically to the to 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 art and the the capacity for creativity, mm -hmm. and I think you you see it in a lot of ways. There are um, certainly a part of the long-standing uh, civil rights movement here in the United States, uh, song in particular, but also the soundscape um, were so powerful, and I think um, images combined with the soundscape were extraordinary in, in the period of the civil rights movement. Um, many would argue that the images of actually seeing what was happening to protesters is what mobilized um, the, the national cognitive dissonance 
that our constitution was not connected to the ways we were actually treating people. And I think that's only become more, um, not only relevant, but very prevalent in the current uh, circumstances. But it's also true that there is, that social change itself is almost always an artistic process. It's asking, how do you bring forward voice? And how does that voice uh, enter and create narrative and story? And how does that story impact the way we see ourselves and the kind of things that we may seek to change? We see that also in reference to your earlier question, how that mobilization can also go the other directions. Um, that is that um, we live now in a highly polarized world uh, here in the United States and not to mention globally. And that polarization lives in bubbles of realities that do not let, or they're almost impermeable, don't let other forms of story and narrative enter. And so we, if, if you watch carefully, there's a constant creative, uh, creative process that functions in ways that are not for the well-being of the whole. And what they do to what they function in is how to create an impermeable bubble so that our reality is exclusive of your reality and that our reality is proximate not only to the truth, but to goodness. And your reality is distant from truth, but simultaneously connected to somehow being ilth, the opposite of health, ilth, or being connected to evil. And those, those become actually powerful forces, but, and I'm sometimes struck at how we do have, that it's, it's all art. <laughs> it's about how humans create and what we're capable of creating. And I, I come back to my fundamental question. Peace building somehow sits in, in, you know, where fools fear to tread, as I was saying earlier. It rushes in the direction of asking the question, how do we crack the bubbles with creativity that permit us to reimagine who we are as a human family? And that's, um, I think, consistently the challenge, no matter what, what, what location you're in. Black Lives Matter has been extraordinary in their creativity, both in reference to how they have portrayed the story, but also to, to images, words, music, symbolic forms of protest, uh, tenacity and persistence in spite of the odds. And it's been, um, for me as a, a kind of a student of social movements, I think it's an extraordinary moment because it has opened up the possibility that this could go far beyond what had, what had been um, imagined to some degree, but also how it was participated in, in, in decades that went prior. It is now a more um, comprehensive, um, wider array of places and people. Um, I live in a, you know, where I'm speaking to you from is in a small mountain town in Colorado, a rural area. And the town right next to us where we go for our groceries or whatever else, masks on and everything that we're doing, has, has a, a small but somewhat limited um, African-American and African diasporan population that's here. But in a very colorful way, one of the streets was painted full bore with Black Lives Matter. That in the 60s would not have been, in the 1960s would not have been imaginable. Um, the places and pockets that people are capturing have been captured by this imagination are imagining how they will, 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 will bring it uh, to fruition in the places they live. I think that this moment is fuller of that potential because of the creativity. Okay, do you want to pause? So, the, the funny thing, I think it's fair to say that artists seem to be continuing to crack the bubbles that you refer to, uh, particularly with the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. So, how do we encourage or ensure that um, artists are tenacious enough to continue the feathering on the decomposing edges, if you like, to feather the narratives? Well, I, you know, the Artists have often been at the at the edges of the budgets and financial support 
uh, with the exception of those that gain a wide audience often and use postmortem <laughs> too often. You know, the recognition of their place um, has not always been in, 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 at the moments when they were bringing it forward. Um, so I, the, one, one of the things is that we have to find better ways of centering, not only the artists, but the capacity of art. And in that centering of the artistic expression, I think we also have to um, reimagine that this is not exclusively about the extraordinarily gifted. That is the, you know, the, the Picasso kind of phenomena that, that you're, you're, you're not an artist if you're not at that level or professionally dedicated to it. That what, what is actually at hand is that we are humans in the ways that we, we create. And that especially in conflict, which often involves spaces and processes that places at the edge of survival, you know, in, in tough conflicts, uh, protracted armed conflicts in particular, um, that, that, that survival itself is a, a creative act, how we navigate the difficulties. So, so the, the ability to, to understand that this, this can not only be a part of how we, we engage with the realities that we have, but that that engagement is an artistic process, that it brings forward, in essence, the creative act is, in its simplest terms, bringing into existence something that does not now exist. And so th that is pretty much what we do every day. We just don't call that art. But I, I, when it comes to the settings of conflict, this becomes absolutely critical because it touches on so many facets of what we're challenged with. How are, how are we staying healthy? How do we heal from trauma? Uh, how do we engage in ways that permit um, us to imagine beyond what we know? We know. And to sit with that which counters the ways that we make sense of the world, which means how do we live with complexity? Well, that's, I mean, all of us should fully understand now with COVID that complexity is actually quite real and it moves quickly. <laughs> it is the, the, the ocean that we swim in. We're interdependent, we're connected. There are a lot of things happening at once. And even small acts make a difference on the whole. These are all... These are all part, I think, of the of the, the wider understanding of art as a part of being human. Okay, John Paul, thank you. Inspirational and a really authentic voice that you brought here to the conference today, and we really appreciate you taking the time. For those of you that have stayed with us and are wondering what's happening next today at three o'clock, I'm delighted to say that our friend Giles Dooley is going to be joined for a conversation with Mary Cremen. Um, on his Legacy of Conflict or Legacy of War project. I can't remember the title, should have wrote it down. So we'd be delighted if you stayed along for that for three o'clock. And again, thanks to John Paul. Thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you soon.